Hi, everyone. <clears throat> We're back with David Vorek, the CEO and lead developer of Skynet, a next generation cloud service for people who want to control their own data. Uh, David Vorek has been a Bitcoin researcher since 2011 and longtime cryptocurrency advo advocate. Thank you for joining us this morning. Hey, great to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess I will share my screen. Let's see if, um, is it working? Yes, we can see your screen. Excellent. Um, cool. So it's great to be here. And I wanted to present on new data paradigms for the web, uh, of course, leveraging Skynet. So uh, you already did a background for me. Um, so thank you for that. And I think, I think you did it justice. Um, so we'll jump right in. Um, so for those of you who don't have a good background, uh, Skynet is a decentralized web application platform. So we want Skynet to be used to build things like a decentralized version of Facebook, a decentralized version of YouTube or Twitter. Um, so we've really stepped up beyond the uh, just cloud storage motif and really moved into replacing the decentralized web. Um, and Skynet is built on top of SIA. So SIA is a decentralized storage layer. Um, it's an excellent technology and, and without it, Skynet would not be able to function. We kind of take the uh, basics that, that SIA has created and then we step those up to the next level. And the main thing about Skynet as a web application platform is that data is controlled by users as opposed to being controlled by corporations. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of background, and then and then we're going to talk about some cool new stuff that we've that we've been working on. Um, so, as background, you should think of Skynet as like one giant file system. So all of the data is in uh, just just this global layer, um, and within that layer, things are are broken up into discoverable data and hidden data. And I just mentioned that for people with privacy concerns. So kind of like Zcash has a shielded pool where you have a whole bunch of coins in a pile and you don't know who owns what. We can also have, uh, we call them hidden data regions where everyone just puts a bunch of files into one big pile and you can't tell you know, which files are connected to each other and who owns what file. Um, so, so that is possible on Skynet and, and it is supported. Um, but really the more interesting stuff is the discoverable data. Um, and so you can put discoverable data on Skynet where anyone else can find it. So within the giant Skynet file system, data gets broken up into empires where each, each user controls their own empire. You have a seed and then that seed is used to derive a public key and that, that public key defines your empire of data. And any data in the discoverable region of your empire um, can be trivially found by others. And so a, a quick example of something that you might want to be discoverable would be a blog post. Um, if you publish a blog post, you want people to just be able to find it and see, it, see that it's there, you don't want to have to explicitly tell people that you published something. They should, they should just be able to discover it on their own. So within your empire, we break data into app domains. And so you can think of things like, you know, a blogging platform should have access to a domain of data that's dedicated to blogging and, and a, uh, a Skynet version of YouTube, SkyTube, should have access to a domain for its own data. An application should not, uh, unless there is user permission, applications should not be able to interfere with each other's data. Um, and so typically the way that it works is that if you have an, an application like skytube.hns, um, that application will be using the data domain called um, skytube.hns. Um, and we use modern web practices to keep the data secure from each other's applications. So all of this is possible using just a standard web browser. So you don't need any special extension or any special software. We handle everything for the user using modern web technology. And, and it's actually been a pleasure to work with to just see how sophisticated uh, Chrome, Firefox, and other major web browsers have become. So. Within the modern web browser, and this applies not just to Skynet, but, but centralized applications as well, web applications are divided by domain, and they kind of sit in their own sandbox. So each application can have its own cookies and its own private data. Um, and then applications can't see 
the private data controlled by other applications. So if you're logged into Google and YouTube and uh, Amazon and, and tw Twitter all at the same time, uh, they can't see each other. They don't, they don't know what's going on between the other sandboxes. Like they can't log in for each other. The web browser keeps that all secure. But what they can do is they can communicate with each other using post message. And the most common example of this happening in the centralized web is the little uh, login with Google button. So if you go to like GitHub, you click login with Google. What's going to happen is, is GitHub, the web page, is going to open a new window to Google. Google exposes uh, using something called post message, an API, that so GitHub can ask Google, the Google application, a question like, is this user logged in at this email address? And Google can either say yes or I don't know what you're talking about. And Google may or may not um, grab consent from the user, right? So it, it could be invisible and Google could just say, yeah, they're logged in and, and you can consider it. Or if Google is more privacy aware, uh, Google may want to check with the user, hey, do you, do you want GitHub to log in using your email address? Do you want to expose your email address to GitHub? Um, and, and typically it is, it is a user consent thing in the centralized web. So we use all of these technologies in Skynet to build a secure data model um, where users can give access to domains to applications, but ensure that applications are only seeing what they're supposed to be seeing. Um, and we call, we call this MySky. And so there's a central application, central as in uh, central to the user, not centralized. So there's, there's one application on the user's machine called MySky that has access to all their data. So when you log into Skynet, again, log into Skynet, um, you give your seed to MySky, and then MySky kind of opens up uh, the keys to your empire. It has access to all, all the data. Applications can then talk to MySky. So the same way that GitHub opens uh, a window to Google to do sign in with Google, applications will open a window to MySky to request the ability to save data or update data or read data. And so MySky ends up being this, uh, almost like a controller, this manager that ensures that applications are only able to see what they're supposed to see. Um, and so we can achieve all of this using the sandboxing of the modern web browser. And, and so we can get this really robust, user-friendly, user-controlled data model uh, without having to make a new web browser or, or redesign uh, the web from scratch. Um, and so that's, you know, that's something we're, we're very happy with. Um, now things get really interesting when you ask a question like, what if all applications existed, um, or what if multiple applications were able to use the same data domain? Um, and I think that this is really where, where Skynet starts to shine against the centralized web. So one, one example would be recommendation engines. Um, when you go to YouTube, YouTube has a recommendation engine. It builds a feed for you, and it, it suggests a whole bunch of videos. And when it builds that feed, it knows you really well. Most of us have been using YouTube for probably a decade plus. It has a long list of browsing history. It knows, you know, all the videos we've liked and disliked over the years. And then it also knows, like, when it when it presented us with, you know, 30 options of videos to choose from, uh, which videos did we click? YouTube has really learned us over the year. Uh, yeah, learn, learned who we are as people over the years, and it's able to make some really powerful recommendations using that data. When you go to Vimeo, most of us have not used Vimeo as much, and because everything is centralized, all that data is on YouTube's control, uh, video, Vimeo doesn't have that data, it doesn't know, know the user as well, and it, so Vimeo is kind of just giving you generic stuff because it, it really hasn't had time to learn you as a person. And so, uh, on the centralized web, YouTube really likes the fact that Vimeo doesn't know who you are as a person. YouTube likes the fact that when you go to Vimeo, Vimeo is kind of crawling around in the dark and blindly. Corporations own your data and they use that data as a competitive advantage and they, they want their website to be the only website where you can have reasonable user experience. They, they want to use your data as a weapon to control you. And that's where Skynet really stands out. On Skynet, all of the data is kind of in, it's, it, it is in your own empire. And as you build up this rich data history, you have the ability to give that data history to any other application. So you can, if we use the shared data model and we let Vimeo 
have access to YouTube's raw data, um, Vimeo can build a powerful recommendation engine and we can give Vimeo the best shot to stand on its own merits um, and give us, give us a reasonable experience based on our own preferences rather than uh, allow YouTube to build up this data moat. But it goes a lot further than just a recommendation engine. As I said at the beginning of the talk, Skynet is one giant file system. Um, so Vimeo can not only see, like you can not only share, choose to share your recommendation data with Vimeo, but also Vimeo can see all of the comments on YouTube. It can see all the videos. It can see all the content creator channels. It can load basically the entire YouTube into your browser, just the same as YouTube can. And so Vimeo can make a new application with a new recommendation algorithm, but still be operating on all the same data. Um, and so this, the modern, the centralized web is this giant game of network effects and gaining access to the most data and making sure no one else has access to the data so you can control everything that's interesting. And Skynet just rips that completely open. It makes data available to everyone and ensures that applications, rather than competing on their network effect, have to compete on the quality of the application itself and, and how good of a user experience can be provided to the user. So, and this is why the decentralized web is going to win. It's just so much more powerful to have data in this big global space where everyone can make use of all the data than it is to have data tucked away into these silos where corporations inevitably end up abusing their position of power to extract the most powerful, uh, to, to extract the most value from users that they can. Again, Google's main mission in life is not to make your life better, it's to make as much money as possible. And so their position of power, especially as you know, Google becomes more mature as a public company, is one that they seek to exploit, not to uh, make the most of for your benefit. They, they want to use it for their benefit. And so this, this is why the decentralized web is going to win. Uh, centralized applications just can't compete with the open data model. There is, however, uh, an issue with the shared data model, which is that uh, if you're accessing the raw data of applications, um, data formats need to be standardized. And if you have like 10 applications accessing the same raw data, um, a bug in, in the code of one application can just completely wipe all that data out. And it doesn't even have to be malicious, right? You, you know, you as a user grant Vimeo access to YouTube's data and then Vimeo makes a mistake and, and in trying to write, you know, append a comment, write a, write a comment on a YouTube video, instead they accidentally corrupt the data and, and erase your entire comment history. Um, that's not a fantastic situation for the user. Even if Vimeo was well-meaning, it, it only takes one accident to have a big mistake. Um, and so the question is, what can we do to make this better? And the answer is this technology we've been working on called DAX. Uh, short for data access controllers. And so similar to how MySky works, where we have a separate application that has access to, so MySky is an application that has access to everything and then exposes a limited API that allows applications to uh, manipulate data within a domain. A DAC can, is a set standalone application that imports MySky grabs access to a specific data domain from MySky and then exposes to other applications a safe limited API with functions like like video or add comment. And so we get away from this uh, raw data risk where applications have to, if you're doing direct data sharing, applications have to be very careful with data standards. If you're using DAX instead, you can use this really clean like video add comment API or you know, whatever, whatever API the DAC wants to expose um, to interact cleanly with data. And you know, a junior web developer does not need to be afraid of screwing up the persistent structures. They just use this, this safe API exposed by the DAC. Um, and so I've made a quick diagram, or, or uh, I had help making a quick diagram that kind of shows you have a host application um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the host application itself is loading MySky to get access to its own domain. And then it's also loading a DAC to get access to the user's common video data. 
the DAC is exposing a safe API lit with functions like like video to the host application, then the DAC itself is also opening an invisible window to MySky to access the data. Um, so that's kind of what's what we've been working on. We're getting we're getting close to time, um, but I've been super excited about this new this new data paradigm, this way for uh, to put everything in the public space and then also give safe ways for applications to access that data. Um, and so just as a recap, what where Skynet is today, um, we've built kind of this global file system for Skynet. Every user gets their own empire of data. Most data, um, you know, with the exception of, of private or personal data, things like browsing history, most data is in a discoverable region where anyone can see the data that you've uploaded. And this is especially important for things like uh, content channels where you're publishing content. And then we can use MySky to create these, these safe layers of data um, for applications to use. We can make sure that applications have access to the data we want them to have access to and deny them uh, access to data we don't want them to see. And then for data that is really intended to be shared between applications, we can ensure that applications can easily coordinate around the common data and also have safe access to data using something called a data access controller. Um, and then most importantly, all of this is happening on the user machine. There is no centralized point. There's no central server that's managing all the data. When you're interacting with an application on Skynet, everything you do is controlled by you, which means you have the, the power to make changes in the future if you don't like you know, one algorithm feed, you can change the feed or anything else about your application experience. Um, and so uh, this has been, you know, keeping me up at night for the past many months. Um, I'm very excited about this. I hope that what I've said today is inspiring and, and is also exciting to you. And if it is, I really recommend that you guys uh, come check out our Discord. Um, so that's discord.gg slash Skynet Labs. Um, and then we also, yesterday, we just published a new website at sciasky.net. Um, you should come visit that as well. And so now I will um, we'll open the floor for questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you, David. So we have one question from the audience. I'll be reading it to you. Uh, how could you prevent hosting applications from caching slash saving user data when a user revokes their permissions? Yeah. So. You can't prevent uh, an application from saving data, and especially if it's been in the discoverable domain. Like once, and this is a common problem with all data. Like once you give someone data, you can't take you can't take it back. Um, once once they've downloaded something, it's theirs. Uh, but you can prevent them from getting new updates to the data. So if you revoke access to a certain piece of data for an application, they won't see new changes to that data or new things that you're publishing. Let's see another question um, here. Uh, it seems to me you're using the decentralized web to centralize people's data. Am I right in assuming if my private keys get exposed, I will lose all my private data access? Um, so if your private keys get exposed, that means that, yes, everyone will basically be able to see all of your data, also all of your hidden data, and they will also be able to make any changes that they want to your data. So it is it is a big deal to lose access to your seed or to have your private keys exposed. But this is a much better situation than the centralized web. So on the centralized web, you have these pockets of data that have hundreds of thousands to even in some cases, hundreds of millions of people's data all at once. And so an attacker who's malicious in a single exploit can, can take advantage of 100 million people at the same time. And so the there's a very strong motivation. A, a motivated attacker can reasonably spend millions and millions of dollars trying to do an exploit. On Skynet, where the with the user data, the user owned data model, the most that an attacker can compromise at one time is a single user. Um, and so these massive data breaches of, you know, are, are really an artifact of the centralized web. Big data breaches don't happen anymore. And, and you're right, you have to be careful with your private seed just the way that you have to be careful with your Bitcoin seed. Um, but you don't have to worry about some application being compromised and then all 100,000 of its users get compromised along with it. Great. We, ha we have some more questions coming in. And we have time for it, so no worries. Um, 
which kinds of applications do you expect to see first on Skynet? Which ones would take longer uh, or more effort to come to fruition? Yeah, so we already have a bunch of interesting applications on Skynet. We have decentralized <clears throat> blogging platforms. Uh, we have a decentralized alternative to Twitter. Um, if you had asked me before the decentralized Twitter showed up, um, I would have estimated that decentralized Twitter would have been one of the later things to happen. Um, but the community took us by surprise um, and, and made something that's honestly very technically impressive. Um, and so there's a decentralized Twitter now. We have, we have decentralized versions of Dropbox. Someone's working on decentralized alternatives to YouTube. Um, and so honestly, at this point, I, th I think as long as the dev is um, comfortable with the toolkit, I think, I think you can make almost anything that the centralized web can do at this point. We've got one question from our Discord. Uh, how hard it, would it be to have multiple identities? And are you afraid of uh, any sort of eclipse, identity eclipses on Skynet? OK, I'm not 100% sure what they mean by identity eclipses. Um, but having multiple identities would be really a function of the web browser. So right now, the web browser reasonably supports, all web browsers reasonably support two identities. You have uh, your main one, and then you can open up private browsing, and you can log in with a different identity. Um, if you want to support like 10 identities, either you need VMs or a system like Cubes. Um, and so like for me, it's pretty easy to have 50 identities. Um, or you need to wait for web browsers to extend so that private browsing mode can have, instead of, instead of just normal and private, you can have like A, B, C, D, E, um, and you can log in you know, 10 different times. But the core technology itself is, is completely fine supporting you know, a million identities per person. Great. And uh, one more question just from me. Last year, we had Skynet featured at the hackathon. And this year, also featured at the hackathon. Would you like to talk about uh, Skynet's uh, involvement? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess so we're, we're made for developers, we really want to see people building on it. And uh, we feel, and also we've received common feedback that Skynet is just, is really easy to build on and generally easier than making centralized websites. So um, whether you're using data storage or not, if you just have a landing page that you want to throw up that people can visit, uh, it's easier to put it on Skynet than it is to run it on AWS. Um, and then same thing, especially if there's some sort of storage element, if you want to do like file sharing, or if you want to uh, publish a blog post, Again, the Skynet's decentralized, so you, you don't need an account to make an application that can save data. You don't need you don't need to sign up for AWS. You don't need to put in any credit card. Info. You just go to the Zyasky website and upload your application. Um, and yeah, so we've we've often found that things things that take you know one to three months to build on the centralized web take like six hours to build on Skynet. And uh, yeah, so we're really excited. We we are always happy with every hackathon that we've done. People do amazing things, and uh, if you have an idea, you should just go for it. I'm I'm sure you'll be surprised at at how fast you can make it. Great, <clears throat> thank you, David, for your time this morning.